Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship's Interactive Bible Study. We do this every Wednesday evening at this time, and we invite you to stay afterward for the discussion that will take place live via Zoom. Hopefully, if you got the link to this particular study tonight, you will have also gotten the link to the Zoom meeting and the password, and we would love to have you join us afterward for a discussion of what we've studied tonight as well as anything else that might be on your heart relative to the scriptures, to the Bible, Bible subjects. And we always pray together. So if you need prayer, join us. We'd love to have you. Before we begin tonight, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the word of God, the gift that you've given us in this book, the Bible. You have revealed yourself to us in it. You've painted us a word picture of yourself, and throughout its pages we see you, and we see the Father as the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts and opens our eyes to see the things that you've given us. I pray tonight as we study from the book of Revelation again that you will help us to understand and see what's pertinent to us, particularly in this day and to us as individuals, to us as a church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, before my father passed away, my folks would occasionally come over to our home where Sammy and I lived. And I remember a particular Thanksgiving day that they came over and Sammy had been working in the kitchen and preparing a delicious meal for us. And there's a knock on the door. And as we open the door, there stands my dad and my mom. My dad says, I'm campaigning for God. I'll never forget that. <laughs> it was, it's been a treasure statement that he has made and a, an event, a moment that I've cherished since that day. My dad was a campaigner for God. And though we didn't always see things the way each of us saw them, we saw things differently oftentimes. Nevertheless, I know I will see him again. And I know that he was a man of God and that he intended to be a spokesperson for Christ, just as I hope to be tonight and in this series of studies of prophecy. Everything that we have studied thus far in our studies on Wednesday night have been a foundation for the rest of what we are going to see in this book, in this book of Revelation. Everything is a foundation. We started in Matthew 24 with the template that Jesus gave us of the prophecies of the end time. And then we went to Daniel's prophecies, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, 8, and, uh, and we are going to go back to Daniel chapter 12 when we come to a point where that becomes relevant in the book of Revelation. But everything that we've studied so far has been a foundation for all that is to come. Revelation 1, last week's study, prepared us for tonight's study and for the tumultuous chapters that are ahead in this book because there are a number of events, a number of tumultuous events that take place before Jesus comes, events that we will experience if we continue to live on this earth until the day he returns. And chapter one, which we studied last week, prepares us for understanding and accepting and not being fearful during the times that are predicted in the chapters that follow. In Revelation chapters two and three, we have messages that were, that John was instructed to give to the seven churches of Asia of that day. And in chapter one, he actually names each of the churches in verse 11. He names them, we will see them again, so I won't re repeat that verse, but in chapter 11, hopefully you brought your Bible tonight. I don't want to hound on that, but it is so good. 
if you can have the Bible in front of you, especially as we go from verse to verse in Scripture, you can see what the Bible actually says. But in, in Revelation 1 and verse 11, Jesus tells John to send letters to the seven churches of Asia to messages that are specifically meant for them and we will find for us today. In, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus gives blessings, commendations, and reproof to the seven churches. Reproof to every church except for Philadelphia, which is one of the last churches in this list. But for almost every other church, for every other church except for Philadelphia, there is blessing, commendation for the things that are good about how they're living their life as Christ followers, and there are reproofs where they are falling short of what he would like to see his church be. All of these incredible uh, statements and letters that are given to these seven churches are from the incredible Christ portrayed in chapter 1. And I would like to review just a few phrases that come from chapter 1 that show us the backdrop in which Jesus Christ comes to his church and says, these things you're doing are wonderful. These things, not so good. And you need to take heed that these things must be changed. And then finally, blessings to those who listen to the things that he is counseling us to do as a church. Notice these phrases that describe the incredible Christ of chapters two and three and four and five and all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. First, grace and peace to you from God the Father, from the Son, from the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the faithful witness. Jesus, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn means there are more to be coming forth from the graves, and they do at the end uh, when Jesus returns. Jesus is the firstborn and the guarantee of a resurrection for those who are his. Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Today, as we see the chaos and the anarchy and the trouble in our world and the disease, all of the things that are going on in our world today, Jesus Christ is the ruler over the kings of the earth and over all of the things that take place. He predicted that there would be trouble before he came. He identified the very things that we are seeing as precursors to his coming. Then it says, from Jesus, the one who loved us, the one who washed us in his blood from our sins, the one who made us kings and priests. Then he says, he walks among us as the one, he walks among the churches, among the candlesticks, which represent the seven churches, which represent the composite church of Jesus Christ for today. He walks among us as our protector. He holds the servants of these churches, the servants who are working for him, who are serving him and working in his name. He holds them in the care of his tender hand, this is the one who commends the good, reproves the bad, and blesses and rewards those who are his. And so we would like to go to chapter 2 of Revelation, where we have the messages that John was told to give to the seven churches. And what I've pr provided for you is a map, a slide with a map on it that shows you where these churches were located in the time of John's uh, ministry and the time of that at the, actually at the end of the first century. These are where the churches were located. You will see on the map Ephesus, a little to the left of center. Above it, Smyrna. Above that, Sardis. 
then Cytyra, and then Pergamum or Pergam Pergamus. And we have Philadelphia, Laodicea. And over to the left, you'll see also where the island of Patmos was, where John received these visions. These are the places that John was to send the letters to the churches. These churches were actually individual churches of John's day. But there were other churches as well. If you'll notice to the left, there's the church of Corinth. Doesn't say anything in the list that Jesus gives John about Corinth. How about Galatia over to the right above, above center and to the, in the right upper quadrant of the map? How about Antioch over to the very right of the map? These are all churches that existed during John's day, and some of them were churches where Paul had actually sent letters, like the church to the, the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, there are also churches that are represented in this list that are spoken of in other places in the New Testament, such as Ephesus, which we just mentioned, Thyatira, that's where Lydia the worker of purple material was, and it was also mention of Laodicea. These were churches of John's day. There are seven of them representing the completeness of the church. These churches are picked out and they're kind of located in kind of an interesting way as John is in Patmos and the first church to get the letter, a letter from him and from Christ is Ephesus. And then you go north and around to the east and then south to the final one, which is Laodicea. It makes kind of a horseshoe shape. If you are a courier taking these letters, they are all in that order. This helps us to recognize that not only were these churches in John's day receiving these individual messages from Christ, and what, can you imagine, can you imagine what it would have been like to actually receive that letter? They would call a special meeting to read that letter to the church. I know they would. It would be, be such a special occasion to actually receive a letter, not only from John, who is on Patmos, basically in prison for his faith, for his testimony of God's word, testimony of Jesus Christ, but to receive this as a message directly from Jesus Christ through John. What a privilege that must have been. And so the themes of these letters were specifically for those churches, but recognizing that there were other churches not mentioned, we also recognize that these churches represented the composite, there are seven representing a complete number. This represents the entire church. It represents the churches of that day. It represents the church of that day as a whole. It represents the church through the ages, and it represents the church of today. The themes were current for those who received these letters, and they are themes that are current for us today. And we want to draw from these letters to each of the churches some instruction and some encouragement that will help us understand what Christ wants us to know as his people. So we're going to go, first of all, to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 and going through verse 7. So if you have your Bible, Revelation 2 verses 1 through 7. We're going to read together, and then I'm going to try to pull out two or three or four things from each letter that might have application for us today. Revelation 2, beginning with verse 1. To the church, or to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right, and who is the angel of the church? The leader of the church, probably the pastor of that church, if they had a pastor of that church, definitely the leader, the messenger for that church, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The right hand is a hand of strength. 
He holds the seven stars, which represent the messengers of those churches, the servants, the leader servants of those churches. He holds them in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. All are referenced to chapter one. Every letter begins with something pulled from chapter one to, to help us realize the connection between the one who is sending the message and the message itself. And we want, we want to remember, and we will see, want to remember who this person is, Jesus Christ, as he is described in chapter one. So this is the one who holds in his hand the seven stars, the leaders of the churches, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, Alongside of every member in that church, there is a person walking beside them, Jesus Christ. And he says to the people of Ephesus, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. That is a great commendation to a church. Don't you wish God could say that, and Christ could say that to you and I as his church of today? Workers for him, diligent in service to him, and diligent to be sure that the message that we are sending to the world is pure, and based upon scripture and not something that is concocted by man or, or polluted by the ideas of secularism or paganism or anything evil, that we are giving a clear clarion to the world of the story of Jesus Christ and watching that we keep the church in good condition. And these were the things that the church of Ephesus was commended for. They were busy doing and defending good. But there was a problem. And the next verse tells us what that problem was. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Is it possible in the busyness of our service to Christ that we can forget who it is that we're actually working for? We are so concerned that all the details and logistics of the life of the church are in order. We're so concerned that maybe our name is somewhere in the front there where people recognize us as a person of, of leadership. Perhaps we are defending truth, but with the wrong spirit. We are doing good, and we are defending good, but we have lost touch with that passion that initially drew us to Christ, the passion for his story and our love for him. Now, it's interesting, as we go on, Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Go back and remember where you were and how things changed and maybe why they changed, what circumstances came into play in your life to cause you to forget your first love. He says, remember where, where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like a tender Christ, does it? But think about that for a minute. He doesn't say change or you're gonna be lost. He says, if you don't turn around and go back to that first love that first drew you to me, you will have no witness. I will remove your witness in the world, it will not be the witness that represents me. 
And so I will remove your lampstand. You will no longer be able to be a light. And how often that's true in our personal lives. We are faulty, sinful human creatures. And we are saved by God's grace. It is a wonderful thing that Jesus Christ has saved us, saved me, saved you, in spite of who we are, as we are, not to leave us where we are, but he saves us, he he accepts us, he receives us as we are. But if things become an interference to our message, if we are doing things in our life that are not consistent with the message that we are proclaiming to the world, if we are, if we are not consistent Christians, if there are things in our lives that create distortion to our message, we really are not being a light. We are being a distraction. And Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, go back and find that passion that you had in the beginning so that your light can truly shine for me without the distortion, without the flickers and the shadows that come across that light that might distract people from what you are saying for me to the world. So he goes on and he says, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Who were the Nicolaitans? It takes a little bit of study to find out who the Nicolaitans were because nowhere in the scriptures are they mentioned except in chapter two of Revelation. They're twice mentioned in this chapter, but who were they? So. We find as we kind of research church history and as we look at other, other passages that will come up in uh, later on under the church of Pergamos where the Nicolaitans are mentioned again, we find that the Nicolaitans were people who depreciated the importance of adherence to Christian principle. They were, they were what some people, what a theologian would call antinomian. They were against doing what was right all the time. They, they said that wasn't important. And in fact, we'll see as, as we move through this chapter that they were people who were accepting of sexual immorality as a Christian, sexual immorality in the church. They were approving of offering sacrifices or eating food that's been offered rather to idols eating foods that had been sacrificed to idols, which was one, the, both of those things are mentioned in Acts chapter 15 as two things that the church in Jerusalem, the leadership of the church, the Christian church that was, that was headquartered in Jerusalem during the early years of the development of the church, those are two things that the leaders of the church said they could not accept from the Gentiles. They said in Acts chapter 15, a good place to read, they said, we accept the Gentiles as Christians, but they need to know that as a Christian church, we do not accept the eating of food that has been offered to idols, which, which, um, which shows some kind of a, an acceptance of idol worship and food offered to idols and sexual immorality. Both of those things are things that the early church said were not acceptable. And apparently in the church of Ephesus and also in the church of Pergamos, we have the Nicolaitan uh, group coming in and tending to break down the sense of purity that the church needed to represent. Probably one of the things that, that the church of Ephesus was busy, busy fighting against, because in the early verses, he says, Jesus says, you hate, you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and they're not, and have found them liars. They were guarding and defending the purity of the church, and the Nicolaitans were tending to break that down. So we find this again. We aren't going to talk about it again. In, under the church of Pergamos, but that is what the Nicolaitans were. 
And, uh, and it's interesting to see um, that this was part of uh, what Jesus was commending them for, is hating the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Finally, he says in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Number one, it's interesting to know where the tree of life is. And number two, the promise is to those who are faithful to Christ, those who hear his voice, those who hear his instruction, those who respond not only to his grace, but to his leadership and lordship in their lives, they are given a promise that they will eat of the tree of life ultimately when we all gather around that throne in heaven and see the tree of life and eat from it in heaven. So now let's go to the church of Smyrna, which begins the message in verse 8. And it says there to John, Jesus says to John and to the messenger of the church in Smyrna, write, these things say the first and the last who was dead and who came to life. Where does that come from? Chapter 1, it's going, taking us back to chapter 1 to remind us who's speaking. It's a reiteration of the beauty of Christ, the incredible Christ of chapter one. He says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. We may not have a lot of this world's goods, but we are rich if we have Christ's grace covering us, his clothing around us. We may not have the greatest clothing, but if we're wearing his clothes, we are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue or a congregation of Satan. There were people in the church of Smyrna that misrepresented the faith of Christianity. And they claim to be Jews, spiritual Jews. We're talking about spiritual Jews here now, primarily. I'm not saying that there weren't any literal Jews that had been converted to Christianity that were in the church of Smyrna, but Jesus is talking about spiritual Jews. Remember Paul said, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly whose circumcision is of the flesh, but he is a, one, he is a Jew who is one inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart. And there were people in the church of Smyrna who claimed to be the followers of Christ, but were of the congregation of Satan. They did not represent the faith of Christianity, the faith of Christ. So, but these people in the church of Smyrna were going through tribulation, and it says in verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Just a passing comment about this ten-day prophecy. In, in Daniel and in Revelation, particularly in Revelation and Daniel, those two books, we see a number of time prophecies. A lot of people have wanted to take all of the time prophecies and make them uh, uh, typical of of the actual time period by making every day a, a year. And there is biblical precedent for that. We will talk about that more when we get to chapter 12. And when we go back to the chapter 12 of Daniel as well, chapter 12 of Revelation, chapter 12 of Daniel, we have more reference to time prophecies. What I'll say at this moment is for the local church of Smyrna, they, uh, Jesus was telling them most likely, and, and this is what, what seems to be the case, that there would be a great tribulation for that church in, um, that would last about 10 years. And we find in history 
that Diocletian, who ruled from 303 AD to 313, well, he didn't rule that whole entire time. He ruled for two or three years from 303 to 306, I believe. And then other Roman emperors who followed him carried on the incredible persecution of the Christian church until 313 when Emperor Constantine came into power and, and signed what is called the Edict of Milan in 313 AD and made Christianity a legal religion in the, in the Roman Empire. And, but during those 10 years, there was terrible persecution of the church that was begun by Diocletian, the Emperor Diocletian, and carried on by his, those who followed him. And so I believe personally that those 10 days do represent 10 years, but they are like a shadow. And we have, I have a slide that I want to put up just to comment on. It, I call it my shadow image. It's a shadow image. We have used other illustrations in the past of how various prophecies of the Bible um, um, foretell a final fulfillment of what they are what they are predicting. For instance, Matthew twenty four, Jesus predicts the uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the events that preceded it, and it is like a shadow of that which is coming at the very end of time, which which it says in, in uh, Daniel 12 and in Matthew 24, both. This tribulation at the end of time will be greater than any tribulation that God's people have ever experienced in the past or ever will. And so this 10 days are, are called out in time to the church of Smyrna to let them know that they are going to go through some severe suffering for Christ and they did, they did, the church did go through, not just Smyrna, but the whole church went through about 10 years of terrible persecution from a Roman empire that was begun by Diocletian in 303, and that was ended when Constantine actually signed a, an edict that made Christianity legal in the kingdom, in the, in the empire. So Jesus is saying to them, this is coming, know that it's coming, Church, it's not just a Smyrna, know that it's coming, know that it has an end. It will not always be like this. And, and then he continues, um, be faithful, the last part of verse 10, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. What an amazing promise to a people who are undergoing persecution. So let's go now to uh, verse 12 through 17, where we look at the church of Pergamos and see what God has to tell us there. All of these principles apply to us today. This is a message to the church of today, not just the individual churches of John's day. So in, in uh, Revelation chapter two, beginning with verse 12, it says, and to the messenger of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Where does that come from? Chapter one, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's thrown in, throne is. This is a particular stronghold of the enemy, a particular stronghold that Satan has in this realm, in this Asia area, which is controlled by Rome at this time. And he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and you did not, did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Antipas was apparently a person who lived during that time. We don't know who he was. He isn't mentioned in church history. He isn't mentioned in the scriptures anywhere. But he is, he represents, Antipas represents those. He is like, he is like a, 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 uh, a representative, there's gotta be no, another word to use for this. He is, he's the embodiment. He is the embodiment of all who are martyred for the faith of Christ. And there will be more who give their lives for Christ. So Antipas is the man 
who gave his life for the cause of Christ during, who was from the church of Pergamos. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you. You have been so faithful through this, where you're living is in the heart of Satan's kingdom, but you have been faithful. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols. And then, if you read the story in Numbers, and then they committed sexual immorality through the idolatry with the women of Moab, and God sent a plague upon them as a result. And 24,000 of them died as a result of their, their uh, rebellion against God and their uh, pollution of the Jewish faith, the faith of Israel. And so it says, this is Balaam. You have Balaam there. Balaam, hold the doctrine of Balaam there. These are, again, people who are depreciating the importance of keeping the church pure from, from the evils of uh, idolatry and sexual immorality. You also have, verse 15, those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Again, going back to what we said about the Nicolaitans before. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them. If you don't handle it, I will handle it, he says. This is not going to be in my church. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the, the Spirit says to the churches. By the way, just a, just a side note. Notice it says the Spirit in each of these cases. We have seven spirits mentioned in the first chapter of Revelation, which is, again, the completeness of the work of the Spirit, perhaps in the seven churches, which is a completeness of the church as a, as a uh, composite of the church of the ages and of today. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. A special recognition that is only appreciated and given to the recipient of, from Christ, a new name written on a, new, on a stone as a memorial of your faithfulness. Such a precious promise. Something that it says often, actually, I think in every one of these letters to the churches, it says, to him who overcomes. Long ago in my days prior to grace, when I understood grace, when I read things like this, I always thought it had to do with that complete overcoming of sin in my life. And it just put a pressure on me. It put a, an urgency on me to make sure that I did it right and that I obeyed the law perfectly and that I was absolutely in harmony with God's, with God's, um, with God's um, principles of life for the Christian. After grace, you know, I understand that overcoming has more to do with persevering to the end, being faithful to the end, being in, in uh, living under the canopy of God's grace and doing my best to represent him all the way to the end, enduring, persevering, and overcoming uh, that which might hinder me from, from fulfilling my destiny in Christ. So don't take, you know, be, be sure that you've got grace mingled in with this message that comes to us because this is from Jesus, the faithful one who died for our sins and washed us in his blood. This is the, the Savior who's telling us these things, not someone who's coming in with a two-edged sword to cut us off if we don't do everything he says that we should be doing. <laughs> so... Just a side note there about the overcoming part. Let's move quickly on 
to the church of Thyatira. We need to move right through this. This is two chapters we're covering today, and we want to be sure to give justice to them all. These things write to the church of Thyatira. These things say the Son of God, the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and a feet like fine brass. Again, reference to chapter 1. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. You're doing better. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to to idols. This must have been a real issue in the Christian church of the first and second and third centuries where idolatry and paganism was infiltrating the church. And Jezebel is just another example of someone who is being allowed a voice in the church. And he says, no, I gave her time to repent, verse 21. She did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Handle it or I will handle it, is what he's saying, I think. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I know who you are. You can't fool me, God says. And I will give each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. This is a message given to the church of the first century. Why would they hold fast until Jesus comes if he doesn't come for 2,000 years later? It's because this message is to us too. It's not just to them, it's to us too. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with an iron, a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we can say to the church. Now, chapter 3, to the messenger of the church in Sardis, write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Back to chapter 1. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. A name that you are alive. But you're dead. When we look back at the church of Israel in the days of Jesus, They had a name. They had an outward presence. They whitewashed the tombs of the prophets. Outside, they looked good. Inside, they were dead. And this is a condition of the church of Sardis, and it can be a condition of some in the church today. We may look good on the outside, but inside our hearts are cold. We only have a form of godliness, maybe, but not the power thereof. This is good counsel to us. Again, it goes back to what Jesus said to the church of Ephesus. You've done all these things, but you've lost your first love. You've got to be alive inside and not just clean on the outside. Be watchful, he says, verse 2, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God or complete, adequate. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Go back to the way it started with you in Christ. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Again, a reference to the very end of time. John Uh, No, Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 12, sorry. Luke chapter 12, there's a whole passage about watching and being ready for the coming of Christ. And here Jesus is saying to the church of Sardis, 
if you don't watch, if you're not alert, I will come as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. That is a message that is pertinent to our church today, to the church of Jesus Christ. We have to be watching. That's part of the purpose of these studies is that we might be watching. I call it the Prophecy Watch series. We're watching prophecy so that we are aware, so that we can be ready through grace, through God's grace, be ready for him to return. You have a few names, verse 4, even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. I can't wait to wear the literal white robe that God has ready for us when we get to heaven. Today we wear it by faith, the white robe of his righteousness. One day he says he will give us a white robe. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is Jesus saying, listen to me. Remember old um, Charles Stanley in his sermons, he would say, now listen, listen to me. Listen. Jesus says, listen. The book of life. The book of life is where our names are written. That's where our membership is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And then let's go quickly to verse 7, the church of Philadelphia. This church, we won't spend a lot of time on this because this, this church is a church that receives only commendation and blessing. And God says to this church, I know your works. I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. A door of opportunity, a door that, that of security. You are a church that represents me so well that I already have a path for you to walk through an open door that leads to the kingdom. And uh, again, in verse 11, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Wait a minute. This is first century. This is not quickly if it was pertaining to his coming then. Again, another reference to um, those who live just prior to the coming of Christ. This is the message that is for the church today as well as the churches in John's day. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. And then verse 14. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, this is the faithful and true witness. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. If you were cold, my spirit might work upon your heart, but you are warm. You are lukewarm. If you were hot, you would be right where you need to be, but you're in, you're, you're in the middle. You don't even recognize. They say that if you put a, a frog in a pot of cold water and turn up the heat and boil it he won't even know at what point he won't it just like he is numb to the fact that that he's actually being boiled to death a great illustration right but but a lukewarm church has all of the appearance of being a church of Jesus Christ but it doesn't again it doesn't have the warmth and the heat that should be coming from our souls for Christ and his message and for the people who need to hear it. So he says, you're neither hot, hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, and I will vomit you out of my mouth. Pretty strong words. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You aren't wearing my clothes. You stand naked without my covering. And so the solution, that's the problem, the solution. Buy from me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. 
Remember old blind Bartimaeus? He wanted to see. The Laodicean church cannot see because it is blind. It is not clothed with the righteousness of Christ because it's clothed with its own righteousness. It needs the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And finally, the invitation. And even though this invitation comes to the church of Laodicea, I can't help but believe that this is Christ's ending invitation to all the churches and to the church of today. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. I will, I will, I will be with you. I will live with you. I will walk with you. I will be your companion. I will be your protector. I will be your guide. I will be your righteousness. I will be everything to you that you need from heaven that you might have a life that is profitable and productive for good in this earth and a life that lasts for eternity with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to you and me today. Father in heaven, today I pray, tonight I pray, I pray that your Spirit will speak to our hearts, point out which of these, which of these uh, fragments of this picture are particularly pertinent to us. And I pray that we may apply them to our hearts, that we may wake up to our need for you and respond to your grace and your goodness and your love toward us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.